Yes. Go. Yes, hello all. First of all, I wanted to introduce myself and welcome you to our new YouTube, new, new YouTube channel for o &H Consulting. My name is Christopher Robin Sabin and I am president and founder of o &H Consulting LLC. o &H Consulting LLC was established in 2005. It is designed to assist families, children, and adults with optic nerve hypoplasia, as well as the systems that support them, such as school districts and community-based agencies, to work with some of the unique challenges, strengths, and characteristics of children with optic nerve hypoplasia, and to educate families and others working with our children, and the children themselves in many cases, in most cases, of these strategies to help them achieve to their full potential, be it educationally, medically, in terms of health care, in terms of housing, community development, and overall ability to become productive members of society. Optic nerve hypoplasia is a very unique and not so well understood condition, although our understanding of this condition has increased fairly markedly over the past uh, number of years, particularly the past 10 years. Uh, it, is con it is generally thought to be as a result of, or to occur as a result of a failure of the optic nerve to develop during pregnancy for various reasons. And it can generally associate with a number of characteristics, blindness or visual impairment, medical complications, particularly pituitary dysfunction, endocrine dysfunction, as well as autism, autism spectrum disorders, autism characteristics, sensory processing disorders, as well as uh, other types of conditions such as attention difficulties and mental health conditions that sort of relate to sensory processing disorder. This presentation, this YouTube video, is based on a series of workshops which I've conducted over the years called Strategies to Foster the Development of Children with Optic Nerve Hypoplasia. And I am going to be conducting this series of videos essentially in three installments. There will be three videos I will post initially to this channel. Uh, the first video will discuss medical characteristics vision and begin to talk about some of the other types of sensory processing and autism characteristics from a medical perspective and I am designing this section of my channel, a section of my workshop as a, a means to just sort of introduce what ONH is and how it can affect not only vision and uh, particularly a child's health, but also, most importantly, behaviors. In the next segment, segment two, which I will hope to post at some time in the next week, I will focus on sensory processing and autism, attention difficulties, etc., impulsivity, and dive more deeply into the characteristics, the developmental and what we would refer to as psychosocial characteristics of the condition. And that basically involves how children and adults function in the classroom, be in the school setting, in the community, in the doctor's office, going to the grocery store and family activities and in other, in other areas of daily life, and how some of these medical characteristics can impact that area of functioning. I will conclude the final installment, of uh, the final video of this workshop by discussing more deeply, probably what most of you would visit my channel to really be looking, information you would really be looking for, and that is behaviors. What are the behaviors that are associated with optic nerve hypoplasia? Some of the stuff like uh, uh, hand flapping, rocking eye-poking, self-injurious behaviors, some of the mechanisms that drive those types of challenges. And I will discuss mostly the strategies that I've developed to compensate for many of those behaviors 
and that some more successful children and adults have used to compensate for a lot of these characteristics that are experiences, but also some of the mechanisms behind the behaviors and some of the strategies that you as families, but also schools, healthcare providers, and other, others in the community can investigate and implement to manage or hopefully eliminate or extinguish some of these behaviors and, and make it so that our body so that the child so that the child with O N H or you if you have O N H don't experience some of the cravings and some of the needs to engage in the behaviors in the first place. So that they do not manifest and so that you're not engaging in behaviors. I'm going to just preface uh, this information or preface uh, my first part of my workshop by discussing uh, just a, a couple of caveats. I do understand that most of you are probably most interested in dealing with specific situations and specific cases, namely behaviors. When I do my workshops, when I conduct presentations and some of the conferences I've been to, generally what people are most concerned about is my child is doing this or I have a student in a classroom that's doing this and how did you handle this situation or what are some of the strategies and I promise all of you who access who visit my page and visit my channel on YouTube I will get to that but first of all I think it's important to understand the medical characteristics and the sensory processing and other areas because some of the behaviors are very complex and it's important I believe for families to understand some of the mechanisms for why we engage why we do some of the things that we do in, in a classroom that may be inappropriate or may be self-injurious or may in fact reflect a crying out for medical intervention it might be uh, something that uh, a, a child engaging in his behaviors or doing these things may need specific medical interventions and they may be immediate interventions. You may need to get a, uh, a health care provider involved or bring in emergency management services, etc. So I will get to that. Uh, first of all, to begin my presentation in terms of medical and, psychoso medical and psychosocial characteristics, uh, again dealing with development. Optic nerve hypoplasia is a condition that is characterized by the failure of the optic nerve and related structures of the brain to develop in gestation. There is some debate on when and how children with optic nerve hypoplasia develop, when that process begins, but we have reason to believe that whatever glitch causes a child to develop optic nerve hypoplasia begins during the first trimester of pregnancy and specifically during the 6th to 12th week time frame of pregnancy. There is also there's some research suggesting it's more specifically between week 6 and 8 in pregnancy. We have reason to believe that for some reason the process of cell division during pregnancy uh, as it relates to the optic nerve which fails to develop. There is a process where excessive cells or cells that are inappropriate or not uh, germane or, or not vital to the development of that child die off. It is a process, the medical term for this is apoptosis. And we have reason to believe that for some unknown reason be it genetic or be it uh, environmental, and the research is really focusing on environmental causes. That process runs amok, that process sort of goes berserk. And what you have is an optic nerve that is underdeveloped or it may not have formed at all, something called a dysgenesis or an agenesis of that optic nerve. Uh, you may have a pale optic nerve. You, in my case, it's what's referred to as power in my optic nerve, which is pale. It may be smaller than normal. It's also important to understand that the process 
which relates to or which causes a child to develop smaller than normal optic nerves and smaller than normal adjacent structures to where that optic nerve uh, from the retina to the optic nerve fits from the retina to the optic nerve which is part of the, the back of the eye is referred to the optic, chi the optic chiasm etc. The process that causes those structures in the eye to fail to develop normally also impacts adjacent structures to where the optic nerve actually connects to the brain. The optic nerve essentially is the area of your eye that transmits visual information from the retina to the brain. If you take any kind of perceptual psychology course or if you do any kind of study of basic study of the psychology of perception or you know just think about it long and hard you realize that we don't see with our eyes typically we see with our brain the eyes process light and the eyes process color and black and white images but it's up to our brains to, the, to interpret the information that passes and interpret the images more directly that pass from the back of the eye to the midline area of the brain. And in optic nerve hyperplasia, that process runs amok. So what you have is a child with varying degrees of visual impairment. They may be totally blind, they may have very limited usable vision, and the vision of children with optic nerve hyperplasia can, ver can vary dramatically depending on the structures that are involved. It can vary from fairly good usable vision, almost normal 2020 vision, all the way to total blindness. What you also have since that optic nerve connects to the brain, you'll end up with a lot of other characteristics or a lot of other difficulties or differences that come out of the fact that other structures that fall right next to where that optic nerve fit into the brain are involved. And those include structures such as the hypothalamus, the thalamus, the pituitary gland, etc. These are very important structures of the brain. The thalamus and hypothalamus essentially function as the body's master control centers. They control everything from breathing, respiration, heart rate, they control other bodily functions. Uh, they also in, involve homeostasis, uh, body temperature regulation. Homeostasis is the process by which uh, uh, the body uh, balances and maintains a balance and tries to revert back to its normal state. And that can be really, and that can be a real challenge for a lot of us because. In most, in many children with optic nerve hyperplasia, me not included, many others not included, but in, in many children, they may be, un, be unable to regulate their body temperature. They may need to have air-conditioned transportation to school. They may need specialized medical transportation to get to the school. They may need to have their temperature regulated constantly in a certain temperature because they don't sweat. The mechanisms that allow the body to maintain normal body temperature, what are referred to as homeostatic mechanisms, don't work as they should, or they don't work at all. You may have pituitary. Pituitary gland is the body's master gland, and it controls the production of all major hormones, thyroid hormone, which might be affected, uh, cortisol, uh, which is referred, which is the adrenal gland, which is basically the body's means of adapting to stress. It produces a hormone called cortisol, and that may be impacted. You can also have uh, anti uh, ADH, antidiuretic hormone. That is a hormone that affects the body's ability to metabolize water effectively. So you may have, and this is a fairly 
small percentage, 5% of children of zero-one age have a condition known as diabetes insipidus, where the bodies can't metabolize water effectively, so they're constantly thirsty or, or they're constantly in a situation where they're needing to replenish their water supply and they drink and they drink and they urinate constantly, they pee constantly. And their urine is typically in kids with diabetes insipidus dilute. It, it, it's mostly water because they're unable to metabolize water cor uh, correctly or properly and they need medication for that. Uh, sexual development, primary, secondary sex characteristics may be involved. Uh, because of a failure of the body's ability to produce gross hormone, which is also produced by the pituitary. So you may also have abnormalities in bone growth. And you may need to have bone density studies done on a regular basis, annually until the child reaches puberty. That puberty may need to be facilitated or it may need to be induced in children with optic nerve hyperplasia in some cases. In some other kids, puberty starts earlier than normal and th that may need to be addressed. And to my way of thinking, the most important aspect of having ONH that is regulated, that is controlled by the hypothalamus and the thalamus is self-regulation. Your self-regulation is a very complex task and it's a very complex subject matter to deal with and that can really be affected uh, by optic nerve hypoplasia. And it can really be affected to the point where a child may have difficulty processing information from their senses. It's something called sensory processing disorder. That may be affected and uh, as I'll spend most of my presentation on, that can really make life much more difficult, if not uh, impossible, with a lot of interventions, therapies, and what have you. And the central nervous system may be impacted. And based on you know, with those types of difficulties, with those types of impacts, you might have a kid with a lot of different behaviors. And these behaviors can range from impulsivity, to what many people would refer to as blindisms or stereotype, repetitive stereotype behaviors. I refer to these behaviors and will refer to these behaviors throughout my presentation and throughout the series of videos as self-stimulatory behaviors. That's a, a term I typically like to use. And those behaviors can really make it very difficult for a child to function in society. But at the same time, because self-regulation is so impacted in a child with ONH, they may experience a constant craving for or a need to engage in these behaviors just so that they can stay grounded, so that they can stay balanced, and that their perceptions of the world aren't adversely impacted, they don't experience anxiety or distress, they may need to engage in these kinds of behaviors on a daily basis. I needed to engage in a lot of these kinds of behaviors up until I was in eighth grade. My eighth grade year, in particular my freshman year of high school, I was finally able to keep a lot of these beasts that were allowing, that were sort of making it necessary for me to engage in these behaviors under control. And I will discuss these in a later installment, in the final installment of this video series. Uh, in terms of vision, vision is what typically most people think of when they think of an optic nerve disorder such as optic nerve hypoplasia. Vision may be constantly impacted and it can range, as I mentioned earlier, from normal, fairly normal vision, 20, 50, 20, 60, all the way to total blindness. It is typically characterized by a condition referred to as nystagmus. And I also need to back up and mention that, uh, that ONH can be bilateral, 
In most cases, I believe the statistic is 81% of children with optic nerve hypoplasia. It is bilateral. It is in both eyes. But in an increasing number of children with O1H, the condition is unilateral. It is only in the one eye. And I have found in the work that I've done and in the Facebook groups that I manage and the, face, the communication I have with families is that the kids with unilateral O1H, the kids that typically had the better vision than the ones I worry about because they're the kids that tend to slip through the cracks. Uh, they aren't the kids typically that are using canes that are needed at these braille interventions and what have you. They're not considered blind. So they end up falling through the cracks and a lot of these kids end up, as I will get into a little bit later, experiencing a lot of difficulty medically and a lot of difficulty in terms of their development, psychosocially, developmentally. They may have a lot of mental health conditions. They may have stuff going on. They may have ADHD that doesn't respond to medication or just typical quick fix interventions that our society likes to throw at the kids or they may have mental health conditions such as bipolar disorder, anxiety disorders, oppositional defiant disorders, delinquency in some cases because they're acting out and they're doing things that may not necessarily be appropriate. They may be engaging in substance use or gambling because that's the only way they can stay focused. And a lot of these kids tend to self-medicate and it really creates a complicated situation, it really creates a lot of difficulties. And those are the kids that typically are poorly understood, most poorly understood. But I digress a little bit uh, because I wanted to discuss mainly vision. As I mentioned, vision in O1H typically ranges from very normal vision, very typical vision, to blindness. And the other thing about the, uh, the children with uh, more usable vision is they also tend to not qualify for services that could feasibly be very beneficial for these kids. And these might include Braille or other types of services such as your vision services, such, your, uh, such as your techniques of daily living, assistive technology, your travel types of training, your or what are referred to as orientation mobility, which is the use of the long white cane and uh, uh, crossing streets and navigating within buildings, navigating a classroom, for example, getting to and from different locations, etc. These kids may benefit directly and significantly from these services and these types of, of supports in the classroom, but they don't get it because they don't qualify for these services. Now, condition, one of the things that is important to understand related to optic nerve hypoplasia, one of the conditions that is critical that most people have, it can almost be a given, is nystagmus. Nystagmus is a fancy term for the movement of the eyes within their sockets and it occurs because typically the eyes don't receive the stimulation, you're not given the stimulation that they need. And so what they do is they respond by trying to focus on objects and that process fails and it creates a condition where the eyes are constantly moving around inside their heads. They're constantly moving around inside their sockets, I should say. And this process can be horizontal, and it can be vertical, and that is referred to, of course, as nystagmus, N-Y-S-T-A-G-M-U-S, nystagmus. And in some cases, a lot of, a fair minority, typically minority of her kids, but in some case, some people who do have nystagmus when it is, when it occurs, when the onset is, a, is an adult, what's referred to as adult onset nystagmus, they will experience vertigo or other physical symptoms. It'll make them dizzy or affect their balance or what have you. 
However, in most of, of my kids, most of the kids that I work with, most early onset or childhood onset nystagmus, or if it's from birth, nystagmus is involuntary, which means that, for example, I have nystagmus. My eyes, my pupils could be moving inside their sockets right now. They could be moving around. They could be doing this way and that way and what have you. And they could be completely crazy. And particularly when I'm lost in thought or I'm trying to focus as I'm doing here, as I'm doing at this point. And I might not even realize unless I think long and hard and really focus and really concentrate that my eyes are doing these types of things. However, one of the things that's extremely important to understand about nystagmus is that it can wreak havoc on your body's ability or the ability of your visual system to process information effectively. And that can make reading, that can make focusing on objects for any length of time difficult to impossible. And this is one of the reasons why I think it is absolutely important for a child, if there is nystagmus involved, if there is a situation where the body is, is unable to process information visually, that we need to be looking at interventions that are not visually based, that are non-visual in nature, particularly for a child that is developing in the classroom. I typically recommend that all of our kids, if there's even just a hint of nystagmus, that we at least explore Braille, particularly Braille. And that is, as I'll get into a little bit later, if it, a child can process Braille, if the child is intactly defensive, which I was, as I'll get into a little bit later. But if they're able to process Braille entirely, uh, I, I recommend that Braille be a primary means of communication and reading, even if, even if the child has fairly good usable vision, because reading print for any length of time can be very difficult, it can be very toxic, it can be very taxing, and it can basically sap the energy right out of you just, just looking at a page for five to ten minutes, even with a magnification device. In my case, I was given, I was recommended, and uh, assigned a CCTV, closed circuit television, which magnifies print. And just staring at that thing for even 10 minutes can be very difficult. And I used to come home from school, I, particularly when I was in fifth and sixth grade, with just severe pounding headaches, migraine headaches, just from having to look at a page for some time, sometimes an hour or more at a time. So these are some of the things that you need to be looking at. I will also discuss uh, sensory processing disorders uh, very briefly uh, before I transition to behaviors and the uh, next part of the presentation and, and conclude uh, th this particular workshop, uh, this particular video by discussing sensory processing. Sensory processing disorders can make it very difficult for a child to determine where they are located, or where their, their body is in space, and the information that is coming to them through their environment. We have reason to believe that the body's ability to process sensory information is related to the hypothalamus, the thalamus, and related structures of the brain that can be impacted in optic nerve hyperplasia. So a lot of our kids, a fair number of our kids, can have difficulty with uh, sensory processing, just their, just their ability to understand where their head is in relation to their body, where which way is up, which way is down, may be significantly affected. You know, sitting down in a chair, for example, as I'll get into a little bit later, may be very difficult without means of further stimulation that the body 
sometimes requires or in many cases requires to compensate for this failure of the body to d develop sensory uh, understand or process uh, what it is taking in from the senses and in so many cases those compensation mechanisms involve inappropriate behaviors including your self-stimulatory behaviors, you know, you're rocking, you're, you're doing this, which is just a, a behavior I'm tempted to do pretty much uh, to just continue doing this behavior because it is that stimulating and that is that soothing for me, but of course I won't. And it also helps me process information, so that you're rocking, you're, you're hand flapping, which is something I used to do quite frequently, you know, doing this, which is something I used to do uh, quite frequently. Uh, you may also have eye poking and you may also have a child that may be driven to involve or engage in self-stimulatory behaviors. I will at this point conclude this section of the workshop. I will post be posting this section on medical intervention, on medical challenges and medical characteristics, but I will also in the next two weeks be posting two additional installments, the first being related to behavioral and psychosocial characteristics, which is your autism, your sensory processing, your communication delays, speech language difficulties, impulsivity, those types of areas. And then, as I mentioned earlier, in the, uh, the next, the final installment will be specifically on behavior. I uh, look forward to hearing from you. If you have any questions, if, all, if any of you have any comments, suggestions, would like to discuss individual children, like to discuss your, your child or your family member, or if you're a school district or a health care provider or community service agency, and if you want to discuss one of your consumers or one of your clients, you can certainly reach me through my website, which is www.onhconsulting.com, and my contact information is on the website. I hope to hear from you soon. And most importantly, have an excellent day.